Welcome to Women Kicking Glass, the only radio show on OC Talk Radio dedicated to empowering women to be the best leaders they can be in any endeavor they choose. Patty Grimm is our host and interviews top women in a variety of fields to help women grow, learn, and lean in together. Patty has over 25 years of experience in primarily male-dominated fields in senior-level management positions. Patty is the owner of Advantage Training Limited, an organizational leadership team training company. She recently released her new book for women called Quiet Women Never Changed History. Be strong, stand out, and stand up. With the subtitle, Let's Go Kick Some Glass. And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning with Patty and her guests. Hey, Patty. Hey, thanks. And this is a one-year anniversary for Women Kicking Glass. So this is, Jennifer, you're going to be my one-year anniversary show, which is awesome. So I have the incredible Jennifer Manuel, 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 Manuel sorry, uh, on my show today. And she's calling in from Sacramento. She is CEO and founder of Via Consulting, a boutique leadership firm specializing in gender parity issues, consultancy, and helping Women lead their best personal, professional lives. We have so much in common other than the fact that she's from Sacramento and I'm in Southern California. But prior to launching her business, she spent 10 years in a variety of leadership roles with IBM Global Services. I worked for Microsoft, so we have some connection there. And she's a real advocate for gender gender parity and leadership and really wants to talk about um, some amazing things today about what's going on in the news, but also gender pay equality overall and kind of dispel some of the myths that are out there. One of the incredible honors she had, and I believe it was last year, uh, or this year, sorry, she actually spoke at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, and that's unbelievable. Um, she's really pursuing some things. We're both active involved in NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners, and we're both very active in political advocacy for women's and women's rights, giving more women on board. So thanks, Jennifer. Uh, really impressive background. So thanks for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much, Patty. So tell, tell, tell the audience about your background, how you got to this place. I know how I became what I call a women's activist, but how did you get here? I think it's a, a pretty common story and a common refrain I hear with a lot of women that I talk to and a lot of my clients. It's the evolution of things that started showing up in childhood that I was really passionate about around this notion of equality and ethics and justice and rooting for the underdog starting to take shape when I was a kid. And as I went through my personal life, my professional career, spending time at IBM and seeing how some of these issues played out in organizations, I decided it was time to step up and start my own business and really start focusing on some of these issues, especially as they relate to women. Um, I grew up in a fantastic home surrounded by really strong female role models Mm -hmm. in my life, both um, in, in my own family with my mom and my aunt and my Nona and uh, just being surrounded by so many family and friends of really strong, powerful, confident women. And I realized that there's, there's so much work that we can do and, and so many contributions we can make, but a lot of work needs to be done to, help change some of the cultural Mm -hmm. challenges and assumptions that we have about what women are capable of doing and and how we can be successful in the world. Yeah, so how is Nana? (laughs) (laughs) She's marvelous. She's incredibly spunky, 88-year-old, wonderful, um, and is, is just fantastic. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I always, you know, when I tell people about my, my upbringing, you know, I was the middle child and middle class family, but my mom was the youngest of nine kids and she was the only girl. Um, and so uh, my dad taught me passion and compassion. My mom taught me tenacity and to have the, the, the drive of a pit bull and the heart of a golden retriever, I always say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yes, it, it's certainly the same for me growing up with my dad watching him. He had his own business and there was never an implication that that wasn't something that I could do too. He was always such a champion and advocate for who I, who I am and who I've become that um, I, I think the role that, that fathers and, and men play in women's lives are, are so important as well. Yeah. So talk about your role as an ambassador for the, um, for leadership women ambassador for take, 
for take the lead women and the work the organization that you're focused on let's talk about that a little bit sure um take the lead women is a fantastic organization it's a national organization dedicated to achieving gender parity and leadership across all sectors and the organization was started by Gloria Felt who ran Planned Parenthood for a number of years mm-hmm. um, before t- starting to talk about how she continued to watch herself and other women give up their own power in so many ways and she wrote a fantastic book that essentially looks at nine power tools for women and it's a very applicable action based read for how women can apply some of these power tools to their life to change the systems that they're working in to change their own views on power mm-hmm. and to change them in relation with others which i think is so important so the organization has launched multiple programs called 50 women can and it's this notion that when you get this critical mass of 50 women together that 50 women can change the world and which i absolutely love so the organization <laughs> has launched a programs in arizona in the nonprofit sector and we're recruiting for our 50 women can program in media and entertainment down in los angeles which we launched about 3 days before the harvey weinstein scandal broke and it's to change women's relationship with power so they can go out and change the world that they're a part of so first off, I want to make sure the audience knows it's Gloria Felt, F-E-L-T? F-E-L-D-T. F-E-L-D-T. And what's the name of the book? Do you remember? It's uh, Women's, um, excuse me, um, Nine Power Tools for Women. Okay, great. So I want to make sure the audience captures that. So um, I talk about in my book the five ways to be a self-empowered woman leader. Um, it's it's all in my book in terms of the five things that you can do that don't require a lot of time, money, don't even require any, anybody's permission except your own. So why is power so important to women or for women, I should say? I think there's a reluctance to embrace power for women because we associate it with the current tone that power takes in our society. And I think that's one, and we talk about this a lot with Take the Lead Women, and in other circles and conversations I'm a part of, it's this notion of the current power paradigm as power over. And power over is, by its nature, something that's forceful and oppressive. We associate it with the misuse of power. Right. And I think it's something that women and men, too, rightfully resist. It's part of this narrative today of the kind of I win, you lose, or might is right culture that I think is so prevalent today. So part of the work that Take the Lead focuses on is, again, the shift in the power paradigm to a more collaborative notion of power, what we call power two. And it's this relational type of power about leadership and creativity and rooted in personal agency. And it's the kind of leadership that the world's really crying out for um, within our organizations, in our government, in so many different areas and sectors that really feels more authentic. It's that win-win instead of I win, you lose kind of power. Well, what's interesting is that um, you've probably experienced, and I know I certainly have, when I've been called a pushy (laughs) B-I-T-C-H, Uh, I've been called aggressive, uh, and that when women stand up and stand up for their own power and try and show that, they're seen as being aggressive and bitchy and bossy, but you don't hear those words with men. When, when people see a powerful man, they go, wow, that's a powerful man. When they see a powerful woman, they go, wow, that's a bitchy, bossy broad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. Oh, that. The three Bs. <laughs> We were just having a conversation about this. Um, we did Take the Lead Day back on November 14th, and and we started talking about these perceptions of power and the, you know, the authenticity of leadership, of, you know, I, I love quoting my Italian family, like the Frank Sinatra, like, I'll do it my way. Yeah. And let's do it our way. It's, you know, there's research that suggests when women – try to put on a 
leadership style and a sense of power that doesn't suit them, they are perceived and are rated as inauthentic. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. for women who have this kind of task oriented leadership style, which is associated with a more masculine style of leadership, Mm -hmm. they always get the highest performance ratings, but the lowest likability ratings, which is really annoying. Right. 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 (laughs) Um, So it, it reinforces this need for let's do it our way of embracing a more feminine communal style of leadership. And yes, let's achieve those high performance ratings and let's do that in communion with other people. So, you know, we are focused on relationships and, and all of that. Let's not put on a leadership style. That's not our own. Let's show up and be authentically who we are. And then other men and women are going to take notice. Well, it's interesting. I'm working with my publisher right now on trying to come up with the title for my next book. And we've gone around the circle, as you as you can imagine, 10 times on 20 different titles. And there's two the two current ones are one is called Yin Yang, Yin Yang Leadership. When she rises, he does not fall. So it's all about men and women leader. And the other one's the the tyranny of the world of the and. And it's about what men, women and organizations can do to make the world a better place, because it's pretty ugly right now out there, as you know. Yes. I And I think you hit on something really important. It's not the, you know, there are some people who are writing that the time we're living in is the end of men. And, no, 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 no. And, Just because you, that, yeah. And that's not it. No. To your point. It, but it is the beginning of a new narrative and a new story for women, and especially reading for women reaching parity and leadership if we choose that, I think. Right. So how do we, so what is your take on how we move from this current power power paradigm to a different power paradigm? Whereas you said, you know, women in the, my early days of my career, if you wanted to succeed as a woman in banking, because I started out in financial services, you needed to Mm -hmm. dress like a man. So I literally, there were five of us in the state of California that all, had similar roles for different districts, and we all showed up in downtown L.A. in a meeting, all five women in navy blue blazers with little white shirts, Oxford cloth shirts with the little button downs, and the little rosy bow ties. And I, I can't remember if we had on blue or gray or whatever skirts and the height, you know. But we looked like men. Like, look, we looked like we were trying to be men. That's how you fit, you, fit, you fit in. And when Glenna, who was one of our VPs, a woman, showed up uh, in downtown Los Angeles in a red silk dress, and this was before the internet or phone or cell phones. That news went from the 60th floor of First Interstate Tower to the first floor within minutes of that. Wow. Lena showed up in a VP and a red flowered silk dress. There is certainly something about wardrobe, isn't there? I still <laughs> smile with with a sense of uh, fondness at whenever I see my my you know big blue IBM suit oh, yeah. hanging in the closet still. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have mine too. Mine were blue, but I have several. I have quite a few of them. So, what are the steps we can take to start to shift this power paradigm? Because women need to embrace the power they have, and like you said, use it in an authentic and genuine way. And so, how do we do? How do we address this and kind of shift this power paradigm to be where it is a world of and? Yeah, I I think you just touched on it. It's this notion of embracing power. So, if the 20th century was kind of about breaking down doors. The 21st century, and especially right now, we're at a very critical time, is starting to walk through those doors. So we're not denying that external barriers don't exist, but sometimes we resist embracing power that's already in our hands. So I think it's going to take this combination of both a mindset shift and action from both men and women. We all have a role to play, right? Right. And there are many who might declare that it's about smashing the patriarchy, but I think that can be a rather alienating phrase, like one that implies, like we talked about before, like the winner and loser. It's them versus us. Exactly. It's not a collaborative notion of power like we talked about. So I'm, I'm an advocate for using like embrace the matriarchy. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I think there's something good there. Um, One of my dear friends, uh, Lex Schroeder, she runs an organization called Feminists at Work. She has a great phrase that I've really latched on to when we talk about how we can shift mindsets and get to action. And it talks about, she talks about 
a lot about the quality of invitation matters. And when we're inviting men and women to participate, we need to focus on the quality of invitation that we're extending to participate in this new version of power. And I think this is really important as we look within the women's movement. It, I, I don't think we can have a conversation about gender with also, without also having a conversation about race. And yeah, I, I think that the quality of invitation that we extend from ourselves to all women to come to the table and engage and to, to recognize that we need to go out and build a new table for ourselves. Maybe the one that we've been sitting at has been having a reserved sign for a long time. And that within the women's movement, we need to start making these steps to include everyone um, in, in a much more meaningful way and focusing on that quality of invitation. And I think also we need to start having some frank conversations about the abuse of power in our society. Yes. I and mean, we've seen the Me Too campaign reach right. a tipping point. We're coming up on the first anniversary of the National Women's March right. um, in January. And truthfully, we're seeing powerful leaders can drop like flies because of egregious misconduct, yeah. ranging from harassment to rape. And so much of this ties back to this misuse and abuse of power and we're having a very visceral reaction to that right now and i think we need to step into some of that discomfort and just kind of sit with it for a while and say yeah ick this feels awful yeah now ick. let's go do something <laughs> yeah oh yeah well, it's funny a year, probably close to a year ago i was talking about some of the things going on and what i was calling the seven scary stats about the status of women and one of them was that sexual harassment was on the rise. And this was a year ago before all this started to happen. And that domestic violence is up and date rape is the number one crime on most college campuses. And that's reported cases. So think about the number of young girls in college that didn't report it because they were embarrassed, ashamed, or didn't think it mattered, that anybody cared. Um, right. And so it is really the misuse of power. And a lot of times what people may not understand is that sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, which I want to talk to you about that for a second, um, is not, it's very seldom about the sex. It's really about having power over somebody else. Uh, and it's harassment of all kinds. Like you said, it could also be harassment against minorities or the lesbian, you know, the LTGP community of people who are simply different. Um, but mm -hmm. I want to talk to, so there's something that, that hit me the other day. We, we've always talked about sexual harassment, you know, and the, what harassment means and how, what that looks like it can be anything from the sexual advances or if you don't do this, I won't promote you or I won't put you in this movie to right. kind of implied more kind of things, or even the jokes or things that are uncomfortable. But recently on the news, they're talking about sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, and this could be rather controversial, but I'm wondering if changing the word from harassment to misconduct is like um, making the, the term politically correct and less offensive to some people. I think it's a really, uh, language matters. Yes, right? it does. And, and I think that when you... One of the power tools that we talk about is kind of setting the terms of the debate, right? And she who defines the terms wins. <laughs> and as we try and PC some of these words when we're talking about what's happening, um, I think that it's in an effort to minimize that discomfort that we feel of instead of calling spades spades or harassment harassment or rape rape, we get this blanket category of misconduct or of harassment or whatever it is. Right. And we start to minimize, in many cases, the, the seriousness of, of the offenses. Yeah. And the challenge when we do that, I think, is that we have this broad category and we all of these things are happening on a spectrum, right? We're not equating a harassment to rape however putting it all under the same umbrella is a little bit dangerous at times too because yeah. when we get so exhausted from talking about it and hearing about it we push all of it away yeah yeah instead of instead of really trying to understand it and it's interesting yeah. because i did a, a a disrupt disrupt hr presentation a couple weeks ago called invasion of the bro snatchers 
which was a, <laughs> which was a takeoff on the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where human beings right. were invaded by aliens and aliens turned into pods and then they came out different. And I was kind of according it to that and the whole kind of bro culture of of how things that are going on in the workplace and, and what we could do about that. But I'm interesting. We've got a couple minutes before we take a break. I'm curious about what your perspective is on all these powerful leaders who are losing their jobs. And we just had Matt Lauer this week yeah. um, come out about some of the things he's doing. The Harvey Weinstein sort of started it. I mean, what are your thoughts on why all of a sudden this started to happen? Because it happened with Uber when the CEO was basically fired for misconduct. And they actually, from an economic business standpoint, Uber lost the contract at all London airports, which is costing them millions of dollars a week because yeah. of their misconduct and the culture they're created. So what are your thoughts on this? And what do we maybe this company is a longer conversation than a couple of minutes. But what are your thoughts on why this is happening and, and maybe some things we could do about it? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to, you know, this. This progression from the Me Too campaign from the National Women's March, we've we're starting to talk, and it struck a nerve. Yeah, um, that's a good with, term. I think with women in uh, enough, and you look at the letter that came out of um, State of California of, of the enough letter of enough is enough. Yeah, and what I think we're seeing in the conversations that I'm having in my groups are people are struggling deeply to reconcile their feelings of love and admiration for a person with how could this person possibly do any of these things and the cognitive dissonance of holding those two very different perceptions of a person can cause some really deep mental and physical discomfort. And I think we're seeing the world struggling to make sense of what to do with those who violate expectations of power boundaries. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Interesting. There's an interesting split happening here, too, I think. And it's, I think, a precedent that was set during the Clinton administration when essentially Monica Lewinsky's narrative was ripped from her is that and there's a lot to unpack here. But the politicians seem to be far more immune to repercussions from their mixed misdeeds and violators in under industries. And I sometimes wonder if because they're politicians, we don't hold them. To, we have a different set of standards or measurement that we're holding them to. Because you look at Lucy Kang, Kevin Spacey, and Harvey Weinstein, and John Lasseter, I could go on, right? <laughs> of men who are <laughs> on, out on, of on. line, yeah. who have lost their careers, their family, their everything, right? And then you look at the Roy Moore and John Conyers and our own president who said, you know, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Right. And it's that violation of of that power boundary that we have yeah so i think there's a kind of a violation of this organizational justice happening yeah. through the misuse of power and we're seeing all of us wrestle with it personally but we're seeing it start to topple giants in in different industries who wield tremendous power yeah interesting well we're going to take a quick break uh, in just a second but i want to make sure people know how to get in touch with you um, so be sure and spell your name and also the, uh, give us your website for your consulting company and, or anything about, uh, take the lead women, anything. So make sure that you spell out your name, but also the company name. So people know how to get in touch with you. We'll take a break and we're going to come back and continue this very interesting conversation. Uh, I think this is fascinating. Imagine what it would feel like to lose everything, your job, your home, your family, your dignity. This has happened to thousands of the men, women, veterans, and young adults we serve at Working Wardrobes. What do we do to help? We provide career development services, life skills workshops, job skills training. We provide the perfect interview outfit, and we get clients placed in jobs. Call Working Wardrobes, 714-210-2460. Donate, volunteer, invest, hire. When it comes to pioneers in their respective industries, we all know the Apples, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of the world. In the realm of recruiting, Decision Toolbox is the industry's best-kept secret. With 90% of their business from referrals and repeat customers, for over 20 years, Decision Toolbox's U.S.-based team of recruiters, sourcers, professional writers, quality personnel, and tech support 
has perfected a Six Sigma approach to talent management. No matter the size of the project, Decision Toolbox delivers incredible results. A cost per hire less than half of what contingency firms charge. With the winning candidate presented in an average of 14 days. All with a 12-month candidate warranty. With results like that, Decision Toolbox won't be a secret for long. Visit us at www.dtoolbox.com for more information. All right, let's pick it back up with Patty and her guest. Yeah, we're having a fashion a fascinating conversation with Jennifer. Jennifer, I want to make sure that we'll do this now and we'll do it at the end of the show as well. I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with you. So what's the best way? Fantastic. Um, so Jennifer Manuel, it's M-A-N-U-E-L. And my business is VIA, V-I-A, Consulting Group. And you can find us online. We're at viaconsultinggroup.com. There's a great tool in there if you want to book a conversation with me and, and get onto my calendar and have a conversation about whatever's on your mind. And the other organization, um, the Take the Lead Women that I'm a leadership ambassador for, mm-hmm. um, you can also find us online at um, takethelead.women.com. And we offer a variety of different programs for, in addition to the 50 Women Can program for media and entertainment and nonprofits. We'll be launching a couple in 2018 right. and offer all kinds of uh, webinars and training and ways to help women embrace their power. And I'm happy to help launch the Orange County, L.A., San Diego piece of that. And in fact, I'm not sure it would take 50 women. I think it might just take maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're powerful. We can do a lot. We can do a lot. So we're having this fascinating conversation. And I know you may have experienced this at IBM, but I certainly experienced in my career in banking and in Microsoft and consulting that it was interesting that a lot of times, I think because of who I am and how I was raised in many cases, if I experienced the harassment or the misconduct, um, I either found a way to make some smart, excuse me, ask comment back or walk away from it or something. I just sort of it never really occurred to me how much I had actually experienced it until I read an article called Why Silicon Valley is So Awful to Women. And then when I was reading this article, I realized, oh, my gosh, I experienced a lot more than I thought. So part of that Me Too campaign, I was one of those as well. Um, so I sort of experienced some of the same things. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, the power that the, the, the things going on in the world today with the gender issues and the sexual harassment, sexual misconduct. What would the world look like or what, what do you think it would take for men and women to have equal power where we don't have this us versus them? I think it's a great question. I've, I've always joked with friends that we'll know when we've arrived when there's diaper changing tables in all restrooms, not just the women's room. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good so, one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that means we'll get there. Um in all seriousness, I I think I think in our world we'd have less conflict. I think it would be both interpersonally and but but globally as well. Right. Um, there would be a, a much higher emphasis on working in relationship with others and on those win win outcomes instead of the I win you lose because I need to retain the power that I've acquired notions. And I think the biggest thing for me is the equal pay for equal work won't be just a slogan. Right. <laughs> it will be reality. Yeah. And the interesting part is that it's already a differentiator for some companies who are saying who are trying to attract a millennial audience mm-hmm. who are saying we have transparency in our pay processes. Right. This is the thing that we're committed to. And that's in, especially when we work, look in our work worlds. Um, this is this will be you know not not just a slogan that we throw around, but something that that is actually taking root. Well, it's interesting. I had um, connected with a woman who's the executive vice president of human resources for Microsoft. She's somebody I used to work for, and I actually interviewed her for my book and about how things were getting better and that they're pretty close to pay equality for women on a pay scale level. I think they're pretty close to ninety to ninety five percent. But still, the number of women in management positions is only gone up like a half a percent in the last year. So as much as they're doing to get the pay equality, they're still not the, I guess, 
role equality, I guess. I'm not sure what the word I would use. So um, that, That's actually exactly what we call it, those of us who kind of dig into this research, is right. role equality. And um, it, it's one of the reasons why we talk about gender parity and leadership it is broader than just pay equity and and that. We've seen women stagnate at, you know, women are getting – we make up 51% of the workforce, we're earning 58% of college degrees, and we make up 18% of leadership roles in organizations. Yeah. And it's been stalled since the 90s. That's one of the reasons Gloria launched Take the Lead. She saw this stalling out and going, what is going on here? Yeah. 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 I mean, I call it the stalled revolution, I mean, or evolution in that we pay has not gone up more than 1% in the last decade, and that... At this current pace, it would take us somewhere. I've seen studies anywhere from 100 years to 179 years to get to pay equality um, or pay equity, whichever term you want to use, and that we've got to do something different. We, you know, what, yeah. what, what we're doing just is simply isn't working. Um, yeah. The United Nations um, has a really great but really awful gender wage gap calculator or pay um, – gender parity calculator. So you can go in and enter the country that you live in and the year you were born in, and it will tell you what age you will be when gender parity is, it, if it continues at the current rate, when they, it will be achieved in your country. So I'm in my mid-30s, and I will be 222 years old. Yeah, isn't, isn't that <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure mine is probably even worse. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because other countries have done some things better. I know we're both familiar with uh, Women 2020 getting at least 20 percent of the women on boards, uh, women board members in the U.S. But yet Nordic countries and Germany have as much as 40 to 50 percent of their board members are women. Um, mm -hmm. So we're still a little bit behind the curve. So what are some things we could be doing to kind of get to that pay role equality? Um, I think it, first it's a conversation about, I, I've mentioned it in the context of, of power before, but it's this concept of organizational justice yeah. and, and really digging into that a little bit. It's, it's something I've always been really passionate about. It's this intersection of kind of applied ethics and uh, workforce and human dynamics. Right. And, Often in the gender pay gap world, we focus on one part of that, which is the importance of distributive justice. So it's this concept of fairness as it relates to the distribution of resources like your salary, like pay, um, and earning that equal pay for equal work concept. So I think some of it is really diving into what we mean when we're talking about this, these discrepancies and looking at the role that, you know, organizational justice plays. Um, because when we look at the data behind the gender pay gap, we read about some of these pretty bad applications of distributive justice. So, you know, I, many of your listeners are probably very familiar with some of this data, but when you control for factors like education and experience and things like that, the cold hard truth is that for every dollar a man makes, women earn, on average, mm -hmm. 76 or 78 cents on the dollar. Right. And again, to look at this, and that's on average. So African-American women are earning 64 cents. Hispanic yep. women are earning just 56 cents. So nearly half of what their male counterparts are making after we control for education, for experience, things like that. So, again, I thinking about what that translates into, right? So over the course of her lifetime, the average wor woman working full-time in the U.S. will lose about $431,000. Yeah, and, ne and never be able to catch up. And, and I think what one thing I think that's important to, to talk about or to realize is that if – imagine being a Hispanic woman and giving almost half of your pay up. Or you're right. almost working half a year for free, if you want to put it in that context. Right. Um, exactly. And it doesn't just impact the woman. It impacts the the U.S. economy because she can't spend as much right. on health care, on family, on taking the kids to the doctor, housing. All of that is is it isn't just the woman's problem. It affects the entire economy of the world when women can't 
afford to the right health care, right schooling for their kids. And then the kids get in that perpetual, well, they go to maybe a lower class, a lower school, and then they kind of get out. And, you know, it just kind of continues on and on and on. Right. And and I think it's that the the opportunity cost of, you know, you could with that much money and in California, I mean, with our cost of living here, we're looking at a figure closer to, you know, six hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's, and, a, that's a nice you know, house. <laughs> yeah, that's it's it's a house. It's putting two kids through public school. It's it's you know being able to feed a family of four for almost six and a half years. Yeah. Um, and and it's not each of those things. It's all of those things, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, interestingly, one of the areas that we're really taking a closer look at is the relationship between being the primary caretaker for a household. And the perpetuation of the gender pay gap. So what we're seeing is that men who are primary caretakers experience the same discrepancy in wage gaps that women do. Yeah. And I, there's certainly a there there. There's a lot more to unpack here around, I think, our biases around the historical role of women as the primary caretaker and the assumptions that we make about women in the workforce of uh, you know, it, it wasn't ancient history when roles went to men because, well, he has a family to take care of. Yeah. You or know, or he's the, the conversation of that kind of stuff. And women did the caretaking in the yeah. home. Yeah. And yeah. we're not there anymore. But unpacking this take, look, I mean, look where we are. It's taken a while. But I think there's an interesting relationship there um, that that is worth exploring more for those of us who are doing research in this area. Yeah, I've, I've, I have literally... I've always been sort of a little bit of a research geek, but now I'm a research geek on steroids. <laughs> I mean, I have so much data and information and stuff in my head and that sometimes I have to be careful when I go to a social environment and not go like over the edge on somebody with some data and facts and you see their eyes gloss over. But it's interesting right. because um, my husband, for most of my, our marriage, we've been married over 30 years, he's been Mr. Mom. Uh, yeah. You know, when I was working and traveling and traveling around the world, he stayed home and took care of our son and raised our granddaughter and a whole bunch of other things. And so it's kind of interesting to see the different dynamic that happens. And now he's gone back to work uh, and he may have experienced some of the same kind of gender gap issues because he was a primary caregiver for so long. You know, one of the things I actually heard, and it was actually from a well-known research company that said one of the reasons or rationales for the pay gap for women is that women take less um, less demanding roles because of that child caring issue or mm -hmm. needing to be that with the, if the kid is sick, who stays home 90% of the time. Right. And, and that's exactly what we're looking at in this, you know, primary caretaker relationship is I think it's 39% of women said that they have had to take um, paid time off because they, um, they are the primary caretaker in their families, and that decision falls on them. And I think this is the conversation that's happening. I'm seeing it happen so much in in reflection of can baby boomer women who are transitioning into those encore careers, but I'm mm -hmm. also seeing it in women who are so challenged with that transition back to the workplace. Yeah, I, yeah I heard a term a, number, uh, a couple of years ago, and I've started to talk to folks about it, especially in the HR world, is having a returnship. So yes. instead of an internship, you take a woman who maybe she was a really high-powered lawyer or she worked for IBM or Microsoft or some company, and maybe she did take a role for a year or two that was a little less demanding, or she left the workforce to either chair for a child or an elderly parent, because the same thing tends to happen. The woman is the one that takes time off to take care of the elderly parent, not just mm -hmm. the kids. Um, right. And that this re uh, concept of a returnship is they go back into the workforce, and maybe they have a 30, 60, 90-day or six-month kind of returnship period to get their sea legs back, to get their work legs back. And then they yes. can be promoted into a position of equal to what they had prior to their leaving the workplace for a period of time. Right. And there are some phenomenal organizations, um, I'm thinking about like Glassdoor and some others of um, who are really, start Deloitte, for example, is mm -hmm. starting to look at the biases within the systems that they have in their organization. So how do we make sure that if 
women are taking maternity leave or now men taking paternity leave, which is a great thing. Um, and, and looking at parental leave, how do we make sure that those who are coming back and making contributions have their contributions fairly rated against their peers? Yeah. Yeah. And, and looking at performance management systems in that way so that we can better compare the work of, um, folks who are transitioning back into the workforce. Yeah. And, and I, it's a topic I know resonate, you know, I, when I worked at IBM, I was very fortunate to see the entire spectrum of men and women who mm -hmm. stepped out of their careers, mm -hmm. became a mom, became a dad, and stepped back into it. And, you know, this notion that women can have it all, I, I think we can if we are honest about what it takes to have it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, when I sometimes t talk to some young, young women, I say, pick your partner carefully. <laughs> Whoever they are, pick your partner carefully of somebody that truly understands what it means to be a partner in a relationship and be able to have that give and take and who, you know, who, who's the one that takes the time off. You know, do yeah. you, uh, a couple questions, and I guess one would be, sometimes when I'm speaking, I'll have young millennium women or young millennial men walk up to me and say, you know, I'm just not experiencing some kind of the things that you're, you're talking about here. Do you do you see any hope for maybe the millennials will help change that? Because they are 50% of the workforce, and I heard by, uh, I think, 2024, they're going to be like 70% of the workforce because baby boomers like me are going to be sitting on a beach in Mexico with an umbrella drink. <laughs> with a fruity <laughs> umbrella drink, yes. <laughs> um, I think there is a generational thing at work here. Um, interestingly, my experience has been, I've received more pushback from very successful women who have climbed the mm -hmm. ladder and gone through their careers and said, well, I didn't experience anything like that. Look how successful I am. Yeah. Yeah. I tell them to look and back. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's both sides of the spectrum. Right. And, and, um, you know, we have Gen X who's smack in the middle of these two humongous generations who just kind of stick their heads down and nose to the grindstone and get the work done too. Yeah. So I, I think there's a generational thing at play, but I think we're seeing in the millennial generation, um, I'll, I'll say a, a move from tolerance in our parents' generation to acceptance in our generation. Hmm. And, and the demand um, you know, with with a workforce as large as I, I put myself in this generation, kind of one foot in millennial, one foot in Gen X, right? Right, that right. Transgender generation, we we can come kind of in force in mass to demand transparency, to demand that people are treated equitably, that we have this organizational and procedural justice in the companies that we work for. And a lot of people talk about millennials, you know, shifting constantly from one job to another to another. And a lot of times when, you know, you dig into some of the debrief of why they left roles, it was because they didn't have an alignment with the core values that they believe in. Right. They, did, they didn't identify with the organization or they didn't see opportunities for growth. Um, yeah. And, and I think there's a big piece of, of that alignment with core values of uh, wanting to make sure that the organization that they're working for is committed to transparency, committed to equity, committed to doing what they feel is the right thing. And they're willing to take a risk. And fortunately, a lot of us have very nice baby boomer parents who will still take us back in if we need to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's being able to walk away from the organizations that aren't committed to this. So I think what we're going to see is an increase in, we talked at the, at the top of the program about an increase in the number of sexual harassment claims and the number yep. of, yep. you know, organizations that are being sued for pay discrimination. And there's been some landmark cases and things like that. And I think, it's one of the, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. There's, there's still a lot of work to do here. And I think millennials are being the vocal advocates for bringing their expectations into the workplace and expecting organizations to, to sit up and pay attention. And it's, it's challenging. It's scary for any organization, 
particularly the big ones who have been at the institutions that have been around for so long, it's going to shake a lot of them to their core. Yeah. In fact, when the Harvey Weinstein story broke, I was just like, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And it's not just in IT. It's not just in entertainment. It's not just in government. It's really everywhere it's been going on. It's sort of what I say is that in the old days when we did sexual harassment training back in the 90s and 2000s, we thought we fixed this. Well, we didn't fix anything. Um, yeah. It was, I think, more explicit back then, and now it's more implicit. But in some organizations, we've just created a culture of tolerance. I mean, I'll use my former employer before. You know, there were very well-known cases for a long time of everybody would go to the big annual sales conference, which for being from IBM, I know you know what this is. It's a big party, and people would get drunk, and they'd have too much to drink, and things would happen, and things were done, and it was inappropriate. And it wasn't until one of the very high senior um, senior CF level, I mean, chief level individual got fired for that behavior that it really shook the organization to the core and created a culture of where that's just not acceptable. And several people have been fired for um, personnel indiscretions. We'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, see, uh, and so I'm proud of the company that they've done that. But for years, it was just sort of you just, you knew these things happened and people knew that it was going on and you just sort of, oh, it was just the big annual conference kind of thing. Um, right. But now it's not. You have to create that culture of, of zero tolerance for that kind of behavior that I actually call adult bullying. Yeah. I think at Take the Lead, we talk a lot about the concept of sister courage. And it's this notion of having, a, having the courage to start a conversation that matters. Right. And we we see it in the Me Too campaign. We see it with the delayed reporting um, because many of the systems are so broken that, yep. that we look at. We see it in women often self-selecting out or not championing for that raise or, you know, asking for the transparency in in their organization for, for pay equity. Um, it com- I think it comes back to this courage to start a conversation that matters. Yeah. yeah. And, and this concept of, of sister courage. So finding the people who are your allies, having deep and meaningful conversations with them, and then um, putting it together with a plan. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the power tools that we talk about is it's, it's great to talk about it. Find your allies. It's great to talk about it. But then get a plan together. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I guess the the last question, and then uh, at the end, be sure and tell us how to get in touch with you and your company again. But I guess the last question that I usually ask is, and, and you've covered a little bit of this, but if there was like a word of or some words of advice to really help women go kick some glass. I mean, I'm talking about you know kicking glass, not kissing it anymore. Uh, what would, what would yeah. be sort of your final? Uh, uh, words of advice for the, for women out there. So this seems so undaunting. What could we possibly do as an individual woman? Right. It, it, it does. It feels so big and it feels beyond our individual kind of span of control sometimes. Right. Right. And we feel like it, it's just, it's just me. I hate that word. Just. Oh, I hate but... the word. Just. Don't, don't, even, don't even start on that one. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> another conversation. Patty. <laughs> um, I think there's really, three levels that we can think about. And I think it starts at the personal level. And then I want to talk about kind of organizational and communal levels. So personally, it's having a conversation about power with starting with trusted friends, starting with people in kind of your inner circle and reflecting on your own experience, whether that's with power on the gender pay gap and this isn't just women, it's men too. It's yep. be willing to examine how your gender and race and sexual orientation and all of those things could have played a role in how you got to where you are. Mm-hmm. And so personally starting to reflect on those experiences is I think where we can all start. Um, and then organizationally, it's back to this concept of have the courage to start a conversation that matters. So mm-hmm. asking you know, whether it's you individually or a group asking leaders in your organization, or if you are one of those leaders, call for it to examine your commitment and policies to address having a workplace free from harassment. 
yeah. gender pay gap. Again, a yeah. lot of these kind of institutionalized things that we're going to have to work to dismantle and then collaboratively put together again. So starting those conversations about let's take a look at where we are and then we can figure out where we're going to go. Yeah, it's like we're ripping the rug up on all the stuff that's been shoved under the rug for the last, you know, 50 years or so. And I guess for me, I mean, I'm a parent, a grandparent, and even if you're not a parent, there's probably a kid in in your life that you love. Could be a niece, a nephew, a, a big brother, big sister, and my kind of plea to people out there is think about the fact, do you want to pass this kind of environment on to you, to the children of the world? I mean, do you want to continue to perpetuate this environment? If not, take action. Do something. Right. And and what would it take for you to do now to start to play a role in, you know, we've we've seen on the bad side what a thousand paper cuts feels like. Yeah. But we've also seen on the good side what a collective voice feels like and that belonging that we have when we start those conversations that matter and then go out and put a plan together and execute it. Yeah. It's, we yeah. realize how powerful we are when we can galvanize around this common mission of, of achieving gender parity. Yeah. So just one, one last quote and then how we get in touch with you. So one quote I love from Margaret Mead says, you know, it only takes a small group of people to change the world. Indeed. That's the only thing that ever has. Um, of people that are just it's enough is enough. So, Jennifer, how do we get in touch with you? And I thank you. This has been an incredible interview, and I look forward to seeing you soon. So how can we get in touch with you? Yes, thanks, Patty. It, it really has. Um, again, Jennifer Manuel, M-A-N-U-E-L, and I'm with VIA, V-I-A Consulting Group. We're at viaconsultinggroup.com. And I can would love to share more information with you about, about Take the Lead Women for you and for your readers. That's at taketheleadwomen.com. And we have some, some great programs um, where we talk about many of these issues that we, that we covered today. Great. Well, thanks so much. And I look forward to seeing you, if not sooner, see you in April at Propel, which is NABO's uh, California Statewide Conference. So you can check it out at the NABO National Association of Women. WomenBusinessOwners.org, um, and you can find out more our conferences in Sacramento next April. So thanks, Jennifer, yes. and have a super day. Thanks. See you there. Okay. Chat later. Thanks for listening to Women Kicking Glass, the only radio show on OC Talk Radio dedicated to empowering women to be the best they can be. Listen each week or download the podcast at patty.grim.podbean.com. To reach out to Patty to schedule a speech webinar or to learn more about her leadership and team training, contact Patty at pattygrimatlive.com. For more information about her company and her books, have a kicking day. 